Komar, before you begin, let me just um, provide a brief overview and um, introduction. So Gomar Vanstrian's background is he's the enterprise uh, data architect at Shell, and in his role, he supports the contracting and procurement as well as the safety environment and carbon management functions, and is accountable for providing a consistent and complete data design across the relevant IT application portfolios. Um, Gomar is also going to be covering in his presentation today all about the data platform, uh, the alignment with external development, the data platform developments as they currently are at this time. He'll be uh, reviewing the GHG scopes one, two, and three support, and how do we maintain the flexibility? Our plans for the next uh, uh, months, uh, nine months, uh, and also just some of the current data definitions and again, some of the developments. So, Gomar, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank and, you, Heidi. Uh, you're welcome. All right, let me see if I can move to the next slides. All right, um, so quick overview of what I wanted to cover, um, building on uh, on the story that uh, that Sammy already uh, explained a bit. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a um, deep dive in the various types of um, greenhouse gas scopes, uh, as these are known as. Um, on top of that, I'll start um, with an overview of how a flexible data design in this space can help us um, supporting multiple industries, as well as linked to the various reporting frameworks, some of which have been mentioned before. Um, and without going into too much of the technical details, I do want to highlight a bit of how the platform um, works, how it's being developed, uh, being developed um, and what our plans for the future, future are in the, uh, at least in the, uh, in the coming uh, nine months. Um, so, what is the goal of a um, of, of a data model in general? Um, let's provide um, structure of thoughts initially, and those structured thoughts can then be put into typically into systems to organize data. Um, so in the in the domain of OFP, we basically want to do exactly that. Um, as being said, there's a whole load of different standards and reporting frameworks out there. Um, some of them um, are uh, more or less detailed. There is quite some variety in that. Um, and these standards also exist um, as, um, as um, standards that are um, covering an industry or are in certain cases specific to a country um, that sets or a region, a jurisdiction that sets regulations around what greenhouse gas um, emission figures need to be reported, how you should be reporting that. Um, but what these standards typically don't do is they prescribe exactly how that data needs to be formatted, the data that you require to um, uh, that you require to do calculations about them. So there's detailed guidance around what you should do. There's also procedures that describe how you should do it, although there is some level of optionality in there and flexibility that gives organization, organizations the option to, um, for example, do calculations in different ways, depending on the available data that they have. Um, and what we, want to tr what we want to do with Open Footprint is build on that and provide that, that, that next level of detail, basically the structure to organize these reporting frameworks such that you can use them to facilitate um, data entry, um, processing, processing and exchange. Um, so by doing that, um, we can get also to a, I would say, higher level of confidence about certain figures, uh, typically figures um, about your, uh, about a company's, organ a company's own operations are relatively well known. But of course, whenever you're um, looking at a whole value chain, of the life cycle or profit product, there of course are many unknowns for the individual players in that value chain because there's a quite a few handoffs as products are being bought and sold. Um, last goal of the of the data model, of course, is to make sure that all of that data that we want to store and the, on the platform is accessible through standard 
um, what's called APIs, application programming interfaces, which allow um, various types of um, software or um, application services to communicate with the platform. Um, so first, um, quick overview about emission scopes um, that we want to cover in Open Footprint. Um, people familiar with, um, uh, with, with, with this area might recognize the picture. It's from the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Um, and this picture nicely summarizes how we determine three types of scope for emissions. Um, in the middle, um, you see what's called scope one. Um, and scope one um, is basically all the emissions associated um, with um, the operations of a company that does reporting. So that could be um, running a factory, it could be um, moving materials or, or people around with, with vehicles, with aircraft. Um, so it basically gives an overview of what your own operations um, basically produce in terms of greenhouse gases. And the greenhouse gases themselves are highlighted at the top. Sometimes one or uh, one or few more are included, but these are the six uh, main greenhouse gases. And of course, the mo most well known is CO2. All the other greenhouse gases um, um, uh, can be translated in, into CO2 equivalents to um, highlight their impact on, uh, on, uh, on our environment. Um, as you also can see at the at the bottom, the, uh, before and after the reporting company, you see um, upstream and downstream activities being highlighted. Um, so those are the um, activities that, as an as an company that does reporting about their greenhouse gases, um, you typically don't have full visibility. And this is where we want to uh, want to pr um, create um, a contribution by making sure that it becomes more easy over time to make sure that also these and what's called scope three emissions um, can be made visible. Um, so as I said, um, scope one is your own operations. Um, scope two, which you see linked to it, um, also typically um, um, has impact on your own operations, but scope two um, has um, um, is basically isolated in a, in a way um, because it covers all of the energy that you as a company consume for executing your operations. So that's typically the electricity that you buy, um, can be from a grid provider, or potentially, um, if it's applicable, um, any steam or heating or cooling um, that you get from another provider as well, but which you use in your own operations. So those are the scope one and two emissions, um, which we are um, which we are um, covering in our first um, uh, minimum viable product of the reference implementation of Open Footprint. So we want to capture those first. Um, but then building on top, going back to the scope three emissions, we want to um, improve the visibility on the other emissions. So on what's what's highlighted as upstream activities, um, those can be, um, um, for example, your employees traveling to work. Um, that's something that produces emissions. As such, it's considered also um, as um, um, an emission that in the end attributes back to the products or services that you as a company sell. The same um, applies to any items, goods or services that you buy from other companies. If you, of course, use them in your operations to produce something new. Um, these products also contribute to the overall footprint of the products that you that you sell as a company. Likewise, um, on the downstream activities, you see a similar list. Um, but then um, this focuses more on what happen and happens after you have produced a product or service. Um, so it can be um, the processing of the, the, the goods and services that you um, that you um, sell. Um, it can also be the use of those. So um, in case of um, in case of a raw material that's being sold, um, of course the, the impact of processing that raw material into an end product, that's also something that um, over the whole life cycle of the product, of course, has impact on the total number of emissions. Um, so with that, this is the with, with this overview. Um, in the end, we want to make that big distinction between first, what do you have visibility on um, as a company that does reporting, which is typically your scope and scope, scope one and scope two, and potentially to some extent also your scope three emissions 
which is called upstream. So what, what do I take as an input? Um, but with the platform, we then want to further extend this um, in, extend this view against um, a whole um, value chain, um, which we're aiming to do with the uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, um, to make sure that we can exchange product emissions along that supply chain. Um, so how does this data design look like um, in a nutshell um, when we consider the picture that we just saw? Um, so at the top, top left, you see um, an overview so, um, of um, well, what's a very much trimmed down version of a data model. Uh, that's all of this which you see on the left. And on the right hand side, you see some example dummy content um, that links back to the objects that are highlighted on the left. So I'll go through this um, st structure uh, to explain a bit how we um, how we organize um, data that's related to emissions. So looking at um, various standards that are out there, uh, thinking of the greenhouse gas protocol uh, or the ISO standards in this space, um, first thing you typically do as a company, if you want to have visibility on your uh, on your emissions, um, is to set um, what's called boundaries. Um, and what's, what, what boundaries um, basically describe in this context is really saying what is actually um, considered my operation and what's someone else's operation. Thinking of the picture we just saw of the greenhouse gas protocol and the scope one, um, it's important to distinguish what are operations that you as a company um, um, are operating and which are operations from someone else. Both in the end um, are relevant, um, but in terms of how you get to the data and prevent any double counting, um, both need to be clearly identified to make the split what's 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 in and out of scope of your calculations and allocations of emissions. So what you see in the picture in the left, you'll see so two um, organizational structures. Um, and with the dashed lines, you see a split being made. So in this picture, um, you see that there is one sub organization, which is actually not part of the of the other organizations on the left, is taken into a scope. These things can happen um, because what you typically do um, is you look at an organization, how it's broken down into subsidiaries or business units. And you say all of these um, business units, their operations, we consider all in scope. Um, but it might be if you have, um, for example, a big financial stake um, in a company, but you're not doing the actual operations, you still might want to um, include it in your operations or in your operations figures if you have the information for it. Vice versa, it's also possible um, you expect the other company to provide the, the exact details around um, emissions related with their operations and you just, as a consuming company, then need to disclose um, a percentage of that figure to your own operations because you have a financial stake in that company. So the first step is setting those boundaries and the four boundaries typically start, like I said, on the level of um, organizations. Um, but the breakdown in the um, into the next level is basically the business activities that you execute as an organization. Um, and these can be very high level um, activities like uh, this is my commercial branch as a company and this is my production branch. Um, but you can break these down into very detailed level of activities and these lowest level tip activities um, are sometimes also called greenhouse gas sources and sinks. So those are the activities um, that produce or um, take um, greenhouse gases out of the air. And where of course producing them is uh, much more common. Um, such a low level activity can be something like, um, um, like um, what you see over here, you have an activity of transporting, Sub activity is road transport, um, and that would, um, in terms of classification, um, if you have road transport, um, biggest source of emissions is the um, is the combustion of fuel, um, and that's typically categorized as something called mobile combustion. So your lowest level activity would be then basically saying driving a car or driving a truck. In the example here on the uh, on the right. Um, now, what you can do for these activities in order to get figures for those, um, basically get information about how you calculate those, you link them to your company assets, to the facilities 
that are executing or involved in executing those activities. So in this, ex uh, in this example, I have listed here an activity of transport, which breaks down into road transport, potentially air or sea transport as well. You and the facilities in this picture would be um, would be your trucks. Other activity could be cooling your buildings, um, and what you would do over there. You don't have a um, have a direct um, facility involved in that. Maybe you want to say, I have my air conditioning system um, that you kind of link. But if you say, well, we just pay the electricity bill um, and we don't distinguish between our air conditioning and our heating system, you might say, well, we just link to the activity, we link the um, consumption. And that's what you see um, over here, what's called activity parameters. Those are all the measures or metrics that you want to capture about the activities that you're executing in order to calculate um, emissions. Um, and again, an example is given on the right. Um, so in this example there, um, and we are staying with the example of trucks moving goods, for example, um, there would be three um, parameters, activity parameters that are being highlighted over here. So the first one is fuel consumption. So for a truck, you want to know how much fuel is consumed and you typically break that down by the periods over which this is done um, you look at what is the carbon intensity of the fuel um, and very very much of course nowadays if you have an electricity uh, an electric vehicle um, the carbon intensity of the fuel might be zero unless you say well actually the electricity is produced um, by burning coal then the um, the electricity doesn't have a carbon intensity of zero, but a higher one. So this carbon intensity in this case of uh, fuel consumption is uh, is, is another um, parameter associated with your activity, but this is typically a static one. Um, so you have a default figure, for example, for gasoline or for diesel that's that's being used and that allows you to do calculations. Then another related figure, which is often um, useful to do a calculation is the actual distance that you have covered with your truck. Um, so those are your activity parameters. And of course, I'm simplifying the world here in, uh, in, in realistic cases when you're monitoring a, uh, a plant, the calculations would be much more complicated and you would stack much more of them. But the principle stays the same. You calculate or first you list down what are the parameters that describe the operations of my uh, facilities. So what and which, which ones are used for executing certain activities. Um, and then you're combining these into calculations um, and for um, for a lot of standard activity standard processes there's a given formula that you need to execute and that for, and what formula you need to execute as well as maybe the the static data like the factors that you use like carbon intensities might be dictated by the reporting framework that you use or that you have to use so that might be something that's different in one country um, um, as opposed to another, because local regulations might say, well, you need to use this carbon intensity figure. Um, so you combine your um, activity parameters into formulas, basically into calculation methods, which then um, can be used to collect emissions at the lowest level. So I have two simple examples, one uh, which allows you to do um, a calculation on the carbon emissions, just make sure that you multiply your carbon intensity with your fuel consumption, which gives the actual emissions of your um, activity um, of truck driving. Um, what's typically important as well, next to the absolute emissions that are being recorded is of course to record the carbon intensity as it's sometimes called. Um, so how many, um, how many tons of CO2 do you produce per distance in this case, but it might also be per product um, that you sell as a company. So that, 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 that highlights how efficient um, are you as a company in, um, um, in producing something. So in this case, you need slightly different figures or you need actually the travel distance in addition to your carbon intensity and your uh, uh, fuel consumption. So you can get the figure by combining the travel distance in this mixture. So again, this is just two very simple examples of um, of doing a calculation, um, but it, it summarizes the way that we bring these things together.
Now, the last step that you typically have to do as a company is combine these figures that you have of your operation operations into greenhouse gas statements. So these hold the actual quantities of um, um, produced emissions, um, as well as maybe um, the intensity of your operations, the carbon intensity of your operations into statements. Um, typically done. Um, um, for the specific break for the specific breakdown of your organization into business units, maybe into the activities, high level activities that these business units are executed um, and then filtered by a period. So that way, in a nutshell, you have summarized how you um, can get to your emissions. Of course, there are very many nuances around this. So, for example, just just highlighting one, if you don't have the direct figures, for example, around your fuel consumption, um, in this case around truck driving, um, what you can do as a, an approximation is saying, well, for my whole fleet, I paid X amount um, for um, an amount of an amount of diesel or gasoline or something like that. And on the basis of what I what I've paid, so basically on my on basis of my invoices, my fuel invoices, um, I I'll, I'll do a calculation of the uh, of the emissions of my uh, my trucks. Um, and you might even have to, um, if you don't um, have a clear picture um, figure about um, the details of the fleet, so maybe you use partly third party vehicles and you don't know whether it's a diesel truck or an electric truck or a combination. In that case, you have to, of course, assume a different carbon intensity of the figure. All of those things would need to be fit into your calculation. So you can say, well, the quality of my data or the uncertainty about my data is bigger because they don't have the direct figures, for example. That's all things that we um, that we want to embed into our data design, so into our model that describe the calculation. So not just the raw numbers, but also these kind of figures. And potentially you want to refer back to the standard that you used that, for example, dictates what figure for carbon intensity do you use? Um, and if you need to provide evidence to an auditor about what were your trick emissions as a company, you want to be able to be articulate which carbon intensity figure did you pick and why did you pick that? So that might be metadata that you want to tag, tag to the actual calculation that you've executed. Um, <clears throat> so with this in mind, um, the, the platform is set up using a few principles that facilitate the whole process of having transparent transparency on what's basically stored in the platform and how it's used. So the key principles are about preserving raw data um, in combination with all data are immutable. Um, so what do these things mean? It means that all data that you take into the platform is persisted um, and cannot be changed after it's been ingested. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't do updates to data. Um, that's very uh, well possible. Um, but every, um, every every mutation to data is stored as a new version, if you can, if, for lack of a better word, new version of the same data set. That way we can facilitate um, full transparency about what happens to the data as it's been processed. Um, associated with that, we want to make sure that data ingestion efforts are minimized. That means that um, data is loaded onto the platform in um, uh, as fast as possible um, and processing is done afterwards. And processing could mean tagging with the right information about who can edit it, where does it need to be stored, um, when was it modified, etc. So the benefits of doing that, um, and the last principle I forget, is to bundle data that's related to each other in what's called work products. Um, so we bundle um, related sets of data together. So think of the organizational boundaries with the activities um, that the company executes. The by these are bundled into a um, into a work product, um, and that's and uh, and that's used. Um, those work products are used to provide. Um, small packages of information that can easily be consumed by a user or by an application service that's, that's um, um, steered by a user. So the key benefits of, uh, of those principles is to make sure that um, 
emissions, but also the factors and all the input uh, input models that we used to calculate emissions or to store emissions can be audited in a transparent way. Um, immutable data, along with um, along with the right metadata tagging, makes it's possible to easily search through all of the data that we have on the platform. So it's organized in such a way that you can easily find back data that you persisted before. Um, and of course, the last one, which is very important, is especially if you exchange information between organizations about scope three mainly, that we do that in standard formats. So that can be easily understood, which facilitates automation and therefore um, minimize the cost of doing and uh, doing so. Um, so I alluded already to, to the implication of this. Um, so in case of a change to a data object, a new version is created. Um, tagging processing done after loading of data. Um, and the last that I didn't highlight too much so far is that the idea of the data platform of OFP is that multiple applications or software services can interact with the same data set. This is different from what you sometimes see um, with, 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 um, with applications or services today, um, is that because this is a single platform, the idea is that um, applications that interact with it don't need to um, exchange data directly with each other, is they both communicate with the same data on the platform. So they both have a connection to the platform um, which makes sure that you can execute basically um, from something like a workflow on top. So you have one application, for example, for setting up your organizational boundaries, if you want to, and maybe the next step of defining the actual calculations for, um, for calculating emissions might be done by someone else, by a different application service, but it's done on the same data set. So there is a, um, um, with the central platform, you prevent direct connections or, direct connections between applications are not strictly needed because both applications if they are um, if they can communicate with the interaction um, service of the platform they communicate with exactly the same data set and only modifications done are stored and again as a new record in the in the platform um, so how do we want to make this flexible um, the main point here to make things flexible on the platform is to um, make use of what's sometimes called a data-driven design. Um, and the idea behind that is what you see in the in the table over here is to have a template um, which, defi which defines, um, in this case, default inputs and outputs for, um, um, for calculated missions. And the way that's done is in, uh, in the example I filtered by an industry sector, um, the activity, as well as the um, emission source. Um, and the idea is that all of our, um, I would say, reference data is organized in such a way um, that it, in case you get, for example, a new um, a new requirement from a different from a reporting framework or maybe from an industry specific um, framework you can bring that into the system with actually without changing its structure um, so as you can see we it's simplified we put we want to put things into a table um, it's not really in, really in reality in the platform it's not really a table but a data object um, but it highlights in this case and i'll go through the example um, on the left, it highlights to which industry sector is, um, in this case, this is about calculation, to which industry sector is this calculation applicable. You can make a selection there. Maybe multiple combinations are valid. Um, you'll highlight for which scope the emission calculation is. Um, you connect it to the activity for which it, uh, to which it applies. Um, and then following um, categorization that's typically used by uh, by the greenhouse gas protocol as well as by ISO standards, you have a categorization that tells a bit more detail around what kind of emission is this. That way you can collect all the associated calculations um, in this case, and the same might work for all the associated input parameters because they are collected over here as well, that you require for executing a certain activity depending on the industry or the, um, the domain in which you're operating as a company. So sticking with the example here at the top, you see um, four 
again, simplified view of the world. For calculating scope emissions, if you're talking about the road transport, which categorized as mobile combustion, if you talk about the, uh, the, the fuel burned, um, two input parameters are required. You need to have an emission factor per mass or volume of fuel, and you need to have that volume of fuel um, that you combust. Calculation in this case is aggregate all the volumes of fuel consumption that you have, multiply by the emission factor. That gives you your emission for scope one, mobile combustion for road transport. In this case, I refer to a standard for factors. Um, this, case, this is one from the uh, International Energy a uh, Agency that provides emission factors for fuel com uh, combustion. And again, multiple standards or multiple um, reference databases provide these figures um, and, and those figures can vary. So important again to include the standard that you use for your calculation in the actual audit trail that you do for, do, uh, for executing your calculations. Um, next example, this is about upstream scope three emissions. So basically this is, um, this is about purchase goods. So in this case, if, we, if for your activity of packaging your, your goods, you buy basically cardboard or paper to do the packaging. Um, so you're buying a material um, and that material, um, the amount of cardboard has of course an intrinsic CO2 emission value associated with that. Um, so you have to take that into account. So um, as part of your packaging operations, if you're a logistics companies, you consume basically carton and paper. Um, so also for that activity, you need to tag um, CO2 emissions um, to that packaging activity, not just by doing the activity itself. And if it's done by hand by, by people, the packaging, there's no emissions from your operations from doing it. But of course, the, the, the carton or paper that you used um, does have these emissions. So, and there again, there's a, there's a standard that holds these factors. Um, so to give guidance um, about um, which figure or which factor you should use for doing um, this calculation. Um, the last three lines are about, um, in this case, an example of uh, um, the cement industry. Uh, there's a, there's a, let's say, a, a, um, a dedicated standard or the cement sustainability initiative that provides uh, guidance around doing calculations for the cement industry. Um, and I just picked up three examples um, for scope one and two. Scope two um, is, is um, as I mentioned at the start of the session, um, about purchased energy, in this case, purchased electricity. Um, so what you need to know is your power consumption and the power consumption emission factor. Um, in a case where you just take energy off the grid, um, um, you can use um, grid factors, which are refreshed yearly, that tell um, from the uh, International Energy Agency, that tell you um, how much um, or which percentage of the energy in the end is green. So basically how much carbon um, is associated with producing electricity. Um, of course, this figure changes if you have, as a cement company, you might have, um, for example, your own power plants as well, or in an advanced case, you might have solar panels. Of course, your power consumption first needs to be um, adjusted for that, such that you only talk about the power consumption of the electricity grid, of course, before you do that calculation. Um, which would be a separate entry again in this very same table. Um, then there are two detailed activities being highlighted, uh, the cal calcination of clinker, uh, which is a typical activity in cement production. Um, as per the cement sustainability initiative, they tell you what do you need to know. You need to know about the amount of clinker that's produced. And from that, you're going to get the, uh, the fraction of um, calcium oxide in there because um, by, by, by heating the clinker, um, CO2 is, emission, is emitted. So from your operations, first you need to know how much calcium oxide is actually in the clinkers and then next step. So it's actually two calculations required to get to your emissions. Um, first get that number and from that number you get the um, the translation factor, again, this is given by, in this case, the industry specific standard that tell you what figure do you need to multiply with in order to get from your amount of um, uh, calcium oxide um, to the number of CO2 molecules that are being produced. 
which um, tell you what your emission is. So this is just one example that um, that covers um, um, the definitions of um, calculations. This holds for all of the data design that we try to do as much as possible, um, um, basically abstract away from the actual content and load the actual content, in this case definitions of calculations as values in, into our data design, such that the model is fully flexible and can be adapted, maybe for um, specific calculations for a company, um, but also to various improvements or changes that are made to industry specific um, or um, country specific uh, regulations. Um, so how does this look like in the, uh, in the platform? Um, summarizing, um, we start off with, with certain inputs. Um, so I talked about the organizational boundaries, your activity data, your measurements, factors, static data, which you either get um, from external standards or if you have maybe in, uh, if you have an advanced laboratory, you may, may have you may have tests about the products that you consume as well. So you might have uh, you might know far better that the fuel you're burning is uh, is maybe less carbon intensive. So all of these data you combine, um, basically you combine, you feed into the platform um, and, um, and in combination, of course, with the reporting framework that tells you how to combine these figures, you store that on the platform um, and that can be done by any application. So also parts of these um, figures might come from one application and others might be um, might come from a second application. But the principle always um, is the same. As I mentioned, the idea is that any application communicates with the same platform such that you prevent direct connectivity that's required between all kinds of applications, which um, could create a whole load of interfaces. So the idea is with the platform, you have the ability by using standard structuring of information any application feed data into the storage it's processed over there and recorded and it's made um, available through a search engine such that you can find content uh, back in an easy manner now then your outputs could be um, carbon intensity figures there could be statements and reports that you want to disclose at an organizational level um, of course there can also be statements for an individual product um, thinking of this whole operations, you might say, well, we're not going to do our calculations for uh, my total amount of emissions, but given by the X number of products I'm producing, I'm going to make a breakdown um, of the emissions produced and split them towards the different products that I'm producing. And of course, if you have um, one step in, a, you're, you're covering one step in a value chain, you want to exchange at least these product level emissions uh, or service level emissions between organizations. So this is an optional step if they, if uh, if your counterparty um, organization also uses Open Footprint, they basically would have the same methods of storing storing the information. So um, um, again, this principle could also work um, with third party applications. Of course, only if as a company you want to do that, you can of course um, restrict data access completely. Um, so there's no default option that the, the whole world can look at your data, but it's a possibility. Um, so how does this look like in the picture of the um, of the um, what's called an, uh, an uh, architecture picture, an IT architecture picture? This um, you saw a very small example of this already in uh, Sami's presentation. Um, this picture covers in a nutshell what the platform is about. So the platform covers the blue parts um, and the main area that I've talked about um, so far is this blue box, the beta platform um, and, and ingestion framework. So the data design, the simplified data design that I talked about just before is sitting in this area. So this is here where we set um, the standards for um, storing data and processing data. Um, and all of that communication to that, to that data is handled through um, what's called APIs, these application programming interfaces. These facilitate the exchange of information from and to the platform. Um, now in our case of the reference implementation, um, and the colors are a bit, mis a bit off here now, um, what's in gray basically is basically not part of the platform that could be any application that sits on top. Um, but um, 
what we have with the reference implementation and uh, Sura will uh, probably tell more about that. Um, what you see in green is we have with the reference implementation of open footprint, we have a default user interface basically. So screens on your computer that you can use to interact with the platform itself. Um, so you can create alternatives for that. You can also say, well, I have my own application which communicate with the platform, but at least there is this default um, 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 front end that communicates with the platform. And also part of the uh, part of the platform will be an, uh, uh, at least the default calculation engine, which allows you to do emission calculations um, yourself. Um, again, these can be done using um, using the template inputs that uh, that I just shared before, which highlight which calculations you can do. Um, and then in your organization setup, you can then define the applicable ones and link them to your actual data. Um, so how do um, how do deployments of the platform look like? Um, so um, just to stress once more, the idea is not to have a single platform for everyone in the world. The idea of Open Footprint platform is that every organization, every company can have multiple deployments on their own, one or more deployments. So if you're a small company, you might only want to have one. Um, if you're a big company, you might have multiple deployments. Um, but these deployments are per organization by default. So just to stress that there are no, there's no idea that this is one big platform that everyone connects to. Um, everyone can have their own setup of the platform. Um, set up the integrations with their own existing software might be there that might be your erp in which you have maybe sales figures or production figures about the materials and services that you buy and sell um, it might be operational data if you have plants it might be third-party data around your travel um, but that would be all within a single company um, and these deployments can be deployed on um, on your own physical hardware if you want to buy a server, and they can be deployed on um, on uh, on cloud infrastructure. Um, and uh, as I was mentioned at the start, for example, uh, um, AWS and IBM and, and uh, uh, Microsoft and others can have their own implementation of the platform. So as a company, you could say, well, we have a implementation and we want to deploy it on our own cloud infrastructure so you can also scale up and down as you want to um, so between different deployments within a company you can replicate metadata um, such that the same configuration applies to multiple deployments while users can be across the world um, um, and and communicate with each instance individually and then what's optional it's possible if you want to thinking about scope three emissions, if you want to know how many um, or what emissions are associated with the services that we buy from another company, that might be something that you agree with that other company. We want to exchange information about that. In that, uh, in that sense, you can connect to open footprint deployments across companies to each other as well by exchanging that information. So um, quick overview of the uh, roadmap and plans um, for, for the next months. Um, of course, our first priority is to, um, and you will see a demo um, in the coming days of that, is to have our reference implementation launched. Um, like I said, that covers not only the platform itself, a full setup of the platform, but also um, um, a user front end. So screens that allow you to interact with the data platform directly. Um, and we um, um, and we allow you to to enter emission data and take out emission data plus related data. So the uh, things like carbon intensity or input figures can be stored already um, onto the platform. Um, and then building on that, we want to um, 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 extend that um, with calculation support for scope one, two, and three emissions. So initially, we have um, we have already have an overview of some industry specific attributes as we call them industry specific um, requirements so to say like i showed in the picture for cement there are some specific requirements what do you need to disclose for an activity how do you do those calculations we want to embed some of those already in the first release and that's something that we want to extend over the um, coming period with um, under other industry sectors to make the platform even more um, widely useful of course as an individual organization you can also define your own calculations and entries um, but this inclusion of these uh, sector support templates make the whole process a little bit easier 
Um, first, we also we have a, a basic reporting capability and data entry capability on top. Um, and on top of that, we, we work um, uh, over the next months to um, basically, um, like I said, extend with for other industries, but also um, start working in a bit more detail around making sure that accounting rules can be embedded and that the auditing and logging, which is um, embedded into the platform can be organized in such a way that you can actually hand that over to auditors in cases in case you want to have your emission figures audited in such a way that it's workable for them. Um, we work with other standard organizations to um, well develop integration with the data platform um, and we want to um, facilitate the process of uh, the reporting input data so on the requirement side um, on the input for, for doing calculations, we want to make sure that you can do checks already up front before you do your calculations. So, for example, on quality of the data that you get into your platform as a starting point. Um, and then longer term, um, we want to consider uh, the inclusion of non-GAG materials uh, because the principle of calculating the footprint of a, um, of a product um, does not only cover, of course, um, greenhouse gases, if you think of environmental impact, other impact um, um, might be important to disclose as well. Um, but the same principles can, for, can be followed for that. So we want to have that into the platform as well. Um, we want to be able to um, facilitate um, external disclosure of information, maybe to regulators, for example, in standard formats, which can be done on top of, of course, the data that already sits in the platform then. Um, and we want to facilitate um, the exchange of um, scope three product for, or partial scope three product for print calculations across a supply chain of organizations that connect to each other. Um, related to that, there might be uh, uh, there might be requirements also for more complex allocations of scope three emissions. Again, in the story before I talked about. Um, you might not always have primary data, so data that you have from your own operations. And so you have to fall back to um, what's sometimes called secondary data. So data from um, um, from standard database that tell these are the default emission factors of product X and so on. These are the rules you have to follow uh, in order to calculate emissions if you don't have measurements or direct data about that. Um, again, that's something that we want to build up as we as we scale out our solution uh, and um, and bring in new features. So with that, I want to hand over back to Heidi. Thank you, Gomar. That was terrific, an outstanding job. So thank you, thank you again. We have quite a few questions. So uh, Sammy or Johan, did you uh, want to share or read some of the questions yeah. for Gomar yeah, or yourself? They would have been answered there also at the same time, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, there's, I think there's... there are a couple. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry, Johan. I think I think there are a couple that uh, Gomar would be good to get your uh, your feedback on as well. Um, I see this one from. Uh, to Balt, I, I apologize if I, I butchered the names, uh, but there's a question around, you know, um, the the need for a universal template and catalog vocabulary to organize the data sets and harmonize the methods before we facilitate the input. How much how much work needs to be sort of done ahead of time to kind of get everything ready to put it into everything we just talked about? Um, it's it's nice to have to have it up front, um, but um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that a lot of companies already have calculations defined for 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 their emissions. Um, the I think the real value of that of bringing the or doing that ahead of time is that you simplify, um, especially for calculating scope three emissions, simplify the life of everyone. Um, but um, like I said, the templated structure is extendable. Um, so um, that way it's possible to do this after the fact, of course, with which if you, for example, change your calculation, then of course will impact the actual numbers that you get out of or, or, as well. Um, but it's not a direct requirement. It's a nice to have, maybe a bit more than nice to have, but um, it's not really required. The more we have, the better. But of course, it's workable um, without. All right. Good. Any yeah. uh, any other questions? Yeah, I think there's uh, one other one around from uh, from Sonia here around the um, uh, 
the questions he specifically asks is, is it relevant where the users are located to choose where the infrastructure is deployed? Um, you know, considering issues around latency and, you know, users being in different locations. What's what's the viewpoint around that, Omar? It's not, that's not, that's not important uh, because the protocols we are using are not latency sensitive. So you could have your open footprint implementation in one country and you could have your users in, uh, in, in various sites around the world even because uh, your applications will be browser based and your data loading is also not data sensitive. So I don't see that as a, that's a real, as a real problem uh, uh, for the, for the implementation. Excellent. I think there was one. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Johan, please. Yeah, there's one other one, maybe. Um, and maybe you see the same one. There was a question about is there a marine version available of? Uh, is the one same one had to me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go for it. Okay. Yes, um, we have, and we're going to hear. You're going to hear about later today, from Gavrin. I think it's late today. We we are we are looking at various industries. And looking at what do we need to add to the scope one and scope two definitions to support an industry. And Marine, I think, is the one one of them we've done, and you'll hear about later today. But in principle, the way we support industries is making sure looking at those industries and see what are the mandatory important fields we need to add to scope one and scope two, and make sure as part of the template you just heard about from uh, Gomar, we can support these industries as well. We make sure that. For certain industries, certain fields are men are being asked for. Go on to anything, add anything to that? Uh, no, that's right. And maybe one thing, just I made the example of the, um, of course, the calculations for industry specific. Um, we're also looking into um, making, I would say, different templates for industry. So thinking of marine, um, in the case of marine, you need to, uh, at least for bigger ships, you need to register, for example, the the identification code of the, skip, uh, of the ship. I don't recall the exact name of the field, but that kind of information we put in a separate template to basically, for example, to label your assets, in this case, ships. So it's not just restricted to, uh, um, to calculation inputs and outputs that uh, those industry specific data. Okay, Sammy, do you want to answer the last question? Is there a carbon footprint for the reference architecture? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say yes, because uh, I think there's a carbon footprint for everything. There's there's actually a number of articles around the carbon footprint of uh, artificial intelligence that I've seen, yeah. but uh, I, I think uh, I, I would say yes. Have we quantified it is probably a better question. The answer is exactly. no, but exactly. uh, I think it's a good, worthy uh uh test data exercise for us so yeah thank you yeah i think this was the last question uh heidi yeah. okay very good well everyone uh thank you we we have a 15 uh, minute break and so we will be reconvening again at 8 45 uh central daylight time and that will be uh, 345 uh, Central European time. And just as a reminder, um, please enter your questions in the Q&A. We do see some of them have been uh, added to the chat, so we'll try to address those as well. But um, just uh, continue with us and uh, we'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>